Good morning, CCDA. Namaste. In my country and my region of the, the world, that namaste greeting, I shared this with you last year, those of you who were here, is a way of greeting each other that acknowledges that we belong to each other, and it says that I am going to bow before you and humble myself before you. Another translation of namaste is that I look to see the God in you. So namaste, my friends. My name is Patty Prasadarao. I am a fairly new board member here at CCDA, and I was invited to lead a panel of young leaders. And I would like to invite any of you who are maybe not up here already to please find your way up to the main stage and join us at the table if you are on that panel. Today's focus is on reimagining the future. We have spent time remembering the past and rejoicing in the present. But today, we're going to take a look to ask ourselves the question, God, what is your vision for us? As Dr. Perkins said, we need to listen and then hear the will of God and go forward. I have to tell you that I am honored to be on this stage with the, the eight people who will be joining me. We shared this morning at a time of breakfast, and I wish that we had had a video camera and a recorder just like you did with the founders. The depth, the passion, the love, the humility, um, the vision in this group of people um, is astounding and humbling. And I'm excited to be able to share that with you, with them today. And I ask that you would pray for us, even as we are sharing with you, that what you would hear is not our voices, but you would hear what God has shared with each of these people as they are reimagining the future and sharing their lives with you. So please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we can call you Father. And we thank you that in even that, we are acknowledging the primacy of relationship, that we are your children indeed. And as such, we can come to you to ask for your guidance, your wisdom. We can rest in knowing that as our Father, you provide for us. And we can look to the future with hope because as our Father, we know that you see farther than we could ever dare to think we could see. Bless us, and may all of us in the hearing of our voices today be blessed with a word from you in this next few minutes. In your name, amen. So as I said, um, we are here to share with you a little bit about our lives and a little bit about how we see God reimagining CCDA's future. And so in that, um, you would actually really need to know these people. And so I'm going to ask, there are some handheld mics, we need to make sure to use them. But if we just go ahead and start, Gabrielle, with you, and um, we're just gonna have them introduce who they are to you so you know the context from which they're speaking. Hello, I'm Gabriel, or Gabriel Salguero. I'm a pastor in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and I'm also director of Hispanic programs at Princeton Seminary. Together with my wife, we uh, pastor a multiracial, multi-ethnic, Asian, Hispanic, and English-speaking congregation. And most of our work in the last uh, two to three years has been around both immigration and education and poverty. Good morning. My name is Chrissy Brooks, and I am from Costa Mesa, California, in Orange County in Southern California. And, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm with them. A team there, uh, we live and work in four neighborhoods and mostly work through what we call neighborhood action committees, um, working with our neighbors to affect change in our community. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Brooks. I am the pastor of Canaan Missionary Baptist Church here in Chicago, Illinois, on the south side in the Inglewood community. Amen. Uh, also, I am uh, CEO of Canaan Community Redevelopment Corporation, which is a CDC attached to the church, which deals with uh, youth programming, youth development. We're all about kids going to college. Um, also, I am a hip hop artist with the group Outworld, recorded four albums, so do that as well. And I'm a Chicago public school teacher where I teach arts for kindergarten through eighth graders. <laughs> Buenos dias, my name is Esperanza Martinez. I am from Miami, Florida. I'm the director, all right, Miami. <laughs> we, um, we started a parachurch organization that works alongside Ecclesia Global, which is a congregation that serves the needs of Hispanic immigrants in Miami. 
uh, five years ago. Yat e bine, Mark Charles in this year. Tsin bekeid ne initially do to he clean the bashes chain. Tsin bekeid ne bashes che do to the chain the bashes nella. For those of you who don't know Navajo, uh, my my name is Mark Charles. I am the son of a uh, Dutch American woman and a Navajo man. My mother's mother is a Dutch American, and I say Tsin bekeid de ne the wooden shoe people. My father's mother is of the Toahiglini clan, which is the water that flows together. My mother's father is also of the wooden shoe people. And my father's father is of the Todichitni clan, which is the Bitterwater clan. I live on our Navajo reservation in Arizona, which span, our, our, our reservation spans three states, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. And I was born in a border town called Gallup, New Mexico, and have been living on our reservation for the past seven years. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Antoine Bennett. I am a member of New Song Community Church um, in Baltimore, Maryland. I, I am also uh, the co-director to Patty. No preferential treatment, Patty. Um, uh, in our community development arm of the church, which is called New Song Urban Ministries, and I directly um, service ex-offenders in the community through our jobs program called Eden Jobs. I have a passion for uh, those who have low to no uh, voice uh, who are, have been previously incarcerated and uh, the Lord has put on my heart to be a service to them and so I'm happy to be here with you this morning. Hello, uh, my name is Andrew Marin and I'm here from Chicago. Uh, I have a nonprofit uh, that I started called the Marin Foundation and we work to build bridges between the gay and lesbian community and the church and we really focus on what does re reconciliation look like in such a politically and socially divisive topic. Culture continues to tell us that reconciliation is when you drop what you believe and come over to my side then we'll be reconciled. Well that's not what Jesus told us and we're really trying to live that out in the neighborhood um, and see, see what it looks like down the road. I'm also the author of the book Love is an Orientation. Hi, good morning. It's a real honor to be here. My name is John Teeter, and I'm a church planter in Long Beach, California. So uh, three years ago, we started Fountain of Life Covenant Church, which is a multi-ethnic and multi-class church among the urban poor in Long Beach. I also serve as one of the directors of church planting, and that's a real passion of mine along with evangelism. And one of my hobbies is I get to serve as the videographer for the L.A. Laker Band. So that's really fun. <laughs> Well, you've heard that these folks are an amazing group of people. And as I said at breakfast this morning, I was humbled to hear their hearts. What we're going to try to do in this time is to just share with you some of their hearts and that for you can hear what God is doing in them and through them, what God desires to do through all of us. Um, this conference is a CCDA conference. In case any of you didn't know and you're in the wrong room, you can find your other place to be, but we would welcome you to be here. The Christian Community Development Association. We've heard a lot about the three R's, relocation, reconciliation, redistribution, as a part of the eight key components. We all know that those are foundational, core principles for the work that we do. But one of the things that we've discovered as our movement has grown is that um, not all of us are doing that work in the traditional way. And so one of the questions that I will pose to a few of our panelists is, um, how is it that you are living out? one of these three R's or the eight key components in your ministry context. And if you'd like to share along with that, something that maybe has been a challenge or hard in living those things out. And I'm um, first going to turn to um, Gabrielle, if you can answer that question for us. Yeah, um, the one I'm really struggling with is relocation. Um, because I, I'm, I was born poor and and one of the, and and then I got a college education and the seduction of of moving out and not coming back and a lot of the young people that I serve with um, or serve um, that lead me also were born, born poor so this relocation thing has been a real internal struggle for me especially because a lot of that has been around romanticizing poverty I struggle with that because I know the psychological impacts that poverty has on children as a child of poverty. 
so when I tell some of these women and men, you know, relocation, they're saying relocation for me is to get out of poverty. I've been studying my whole life to get out of here. Um, so it, it's really a struggle to live it and, and, and to breathe it and, and to be it and, and, and to not be a hero. I'm concerned about that, that co kind of commodification. Look what, how great you are and, and marketing. And, so I really, even when I got invited here, I struggled. Should I say yes? Am I feeding the monster of making it grandiose? Or should I just be about my business, do what I do? On the flip side is, if I don't come, how do we inspire? How do we encourage? How do we show solidarity? So relocation is a, is a struggle for me. I think the story of the incarnation is what helps me remembering Jesus and his radical relocation. Uh, but downward mobility is probably the biggest challenge that, that God is helping me with. Amen. Thank you. Andrew, how about you? You know, I think one of the things that you just said about the romanticizing of poverty, I, I think from my perspective, one of the interesting things is that, and I think this brings power to what the three R's actually say and what they do and the impact they have. There are certain things that are transcultural and they're transgenerational and they're principles that no matter where you are, no matter what time you're at, no matter where you live, they are going to be applicable. And in that, with the three R's, here's something that has been interesting with my journey with CCDA is that, that I live out the three R's just in a totally different non-poverty context. And it's so funny for me to, and not funny like haha, -ha, but it's, it's interesting for me to look at the situation and, and CCDA's core and their root is always going to be about the poor. But I'll tell you what, for, for white males like myself grew, growing up in the evangelical church, you know what? It's cool to move to Africa and do missionary there. It's cool these days now, well, let's move into at-risk communities and, and do things there. You know what's not cool? moving in the middle of the gay community. Go to Castro, go to Boys Town, go to the village in Miami and South Beach. And I think such an important message for all of us to hear is that these three R's, they have power behind it because they're real and they're based in Jesus. They're based in the Bible. And so if you have something uh, inside of you and it's just saying, you know, I feel like the Lord's given me heart for this or that, but, but it seems like everyone around me is just... Uh, working with the poor go and do it be bold enough to step out and say you know what these principles are are applicable no matter what and I, I want to encourage us and I think that's something that as we move forward in this movement in CCDA that we really have to realize that there's power in these things and Jesus is behind it and we can go out and we can mobilize in a lot of different areas all over the world in a lot of different populations Mark thank you the three R's can drive fear into the heart of my people because if you start talking to a native person about relocation, um, they're not going to trust anything you're going to say afterwards. <laughs> For me, at the heart of what I'm trying to do is around reconciliation. And nine years ago, I was the pastor of a church to a native community in Denver, Colorado. And God called me to move to our reservation. And my family, my wife and my son, we moved into a small hogan, six miles off the road on a dirt road. We had no running water, we had no electricity, we had a dirt floor, a one-room hogan, and an outhouse 50 yards away from where we were sleeping. And when we moved there, we knew we were going into that situation and we knew it was going to be hard. But that was not the hardest thing about living there. I have never felt so overlooked, so marginalized, so abandoned by a country as I felt for those three years and continuing now to live on our reservation. I struggled to know how to share what I was feeling with people without turning into this angry Indian who would stand up and yell and just shut down the conversation. And I was trying to describe to some friends of mine in a letter and I said to them, being Native American and living on the reservation, I feel like I am an old grandmother and I have a very large and a very beautiful house. And years ago, some people came into the, my house and they took me upstairs and they locked me in a bedroom. Today, my house is full of people. There are people sitting on my furniture, eating my food, enjoying my house. There is a very large party going on. My door has been unlocked, 
but it is much later and I'm tired, I am old, I am weak and I'm sick. And the thing that hurts me the most is that nobody ever comes up to the bedroom, knocks on the door, pulls up a chair, sits down by my bed, looks me in the eye and says, thank you. Thank you for letting me live in your house. That's the pain I feel as a follower of Christ. That's the pain I feel as a Navajo person, a Navajo man. That's the pain my community feels as we've been overtaken by this country that has built itself up all around us. Thank you. Antoine. Well, our ministry in, uh, through New Song in Baltimore uh, lives out the three R's from the founding director, uh, even um, until now. And uh, the way I'll answer in two parts quickly, uh, I believe that we're living it out through your and I uh, position and uh, work in Santana as co-directors. Uh, you uh, historically have a master's in public health and I historically have a master's in public hurt as an ex-offender, um, but through Christ, um, we are uh, together uh, doing the work on behalf of the, our community uh, that we both call homes, buying homes in the community. Uh, and so I believe redistribution is a uh, weird example of that, and I'm happy to be a part of that. I know uh, firsthand the power of what Christ can do, um, I could not envision myself uh, being before you uh, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, um, would you be on the stage with such a illustrious group of folks um, who are speaking from the heart and are doing dynamic things in their community? I couldn't even envision it. Uh, but to have a philosophy, a set of principles, such as the three R's, being demonstrated, and I didn't have to leave home, my home community, to embrace these principles and to live them out and, and to serve my God. Uh, it's just a wonderful feeling. Uh, one of the things that has been a, um, I would say, a challenge for us as a ministry, um, even though we're a CCDA model as a ministry, uh, has been our um, leadership succession. Um, we were hit hard when we uh, just uh, three months ago lost one of our founding directors, uh, a very um, important man a mentor, a friend, a strong man in the Lord. Uh, his name is Alan Tibbles, um, coach and Noel, and Dr. Perkins are familiar with this wonderful man who relocated 22 plus years ago to be my neighbor, be my friend. And uh, he passed, went on to be, on, uh, be with the Lord. And I, you know, we feel uh, his absence and we know that the Lord is uh, working his plan, but we do feel his absence and so I'll charge now uh, that we have to not just back home but here as well is to make sure that we are paying attention we're looking out and listening out uh, for the next generation leaders who are amongst us uh, I believe someone said it's 51 percent of our, our audience and our, our members and our participation uh, even at this conference have been youth who are under or people under the age of 30 and that's something that really uh, just touches my heart and pours in my heart. I know Alan would be proud of that, Alan Tibbles, because he believed in the youth. He believed in uh, what uh, the youth can do when they embrace and give their lives over to the Lord. And so, um, you know, I, I know what the Lord can do, people. I went from being an ex-con to an icon and it feels good. <laughs> Amen. It's, um, it's going to be a challenge for us as we look to the future because um, a challenge and a joyful challenge as we try to define um, who are we as we ask that question. Um, what does CCDA look like? And it looks very different, as you can tell, in each of our ministry contexts. And now I'm going to turn to a question of asking a few of the other panelists. What challenges do you think that might be facing CCDA as we look to the future? Um, are there any threats on the horizon or things that you, are, are, you know might be fears for CCDA? Um, Jonathan? Uh, thank you, Patty. Uh, for me, uh, my context really gives me a, a, a really narrow view in some senses, and I'm thankful for CCDA for broadening it 
in so many areas, but those of you who've been in Chicago these uh, past few days, if you've turned on the news at all, you know that this was the first week of school for Chicago Public Schools. And um, it's a pandemic, it's an epidemic of destruction in our city to, to see our, our, our young students murdered brutally. Um, and as someone who that directly affects, I've lost three students that I've taught um, within the last year. Uh, it pains me to come to CCDA and feel like um, what I directly see going on in the city with all of these fellow practitioners here um, is not getting the address that I feel it deserves. Um, from my heart as a leader, I know that I cannot sit idly by, turn on the news every morning and see uh, my fellow African-American young men murdered brutally and our, can, our conversation not be at all about that. And so the challenge for CC Day is going to be, I believe, is that wherever we are, um, especially when we come together and, as I call it, invade a city, that we invade the city, but we come with that city on our hearts. We come with those people on our hearts because after you all leave, we're still here. And so what can, as, a, as, a, as an association, what can we bring uh, to the table to address what's going on in that place, to, to pray for them, to support them, to deal with those issues. And if we don't do it, um, I think we'll just become a traveling circus. And so address, be honest, be real, don't have an agenda before you come, find out what's going on there and get to work. Um, I think that the, the challenge that we face for CCDA as, as someone who's a strong advocate for immigration reform is that um, CCDA, CCDA does not shy away from its prophetic voice to be political and to be engaged politically, to seek to change the structures that perpetuate poverty and under-resourced communities at many levels. And I think that also... Uh, it be, you know, begs CCDA in the future to take a stand and take a position and not let fear of alienating some of its association members um, to be the factor that it would um, not let it take a position on whatever issue, in this case for me, immigration, it may be something else tomorrow. So that um, I, I was thankful that the immigration issue was discussed this time around because it's something that... Um, has been silent in the Christian faith for a very, very long time. And that is not to diminish what happens in our cities when we were in Miami dealing with our own issues. But that it is important and that uh, as we struggle, so we struggle to diversify and as we look up here and we look so very different and I think that's what we want, that it just not be a diversification of nationalities and ethnicities, but also of context and how CCD gets played out uh, back home that, um, and that, there's a, a, that we resist to conform to the institution, that we do not make CCDA uh, a social club uh, and a place where we gather annually and we get, and it's, it's, it's a restful place and I, I understand that I've been, I've been, since I found out about CCDA um, five years ago, I've only missed one conference because I find that this is a place where I can be, feel comfortable in being different and at the same time being accepted and at the same time, being the mirror for some people that challenges their perspective. So um, I think that the other challenge is to seek out those dissenting voices within us, not to get them to conform to, view, to our point of view, but to hear them out and understanding where we disagree. And as we had our spirit-led spar in immigration yesterday, that we love one another, that we hold on to one another as we continue to formulate and understand and live it out in our communities and understand that there's so many issues that CCDA is going to confront soon, tomorrow, five years from now, but that, um, that we just, we resist this conforming idea that we're all here on the same page, which we're not. Uh, we are not, but it's okay to disagree. Thank you. Thank you. John. 
Well, I think our biggest challenge is that every ministry is one generation away from extinction. And our world is changing very rapidly. I love what the uh, comedian Chris Watt Rock says. He says, you know your world is changing when the best golfer is black, <laughs> the best rapper is white, and I would add the tallest center in the NBA is Chinese. So we're in a changing context, and I think we need to figure out what does it look like for church and the gospel to be relevant, as Dr. Perkins was speaking this morning. The biggest problem is we're sinners, and how do we make this good news relevant to the people so they hear it as good news? 84% of America doesn't go to church. So 16 of 100 people in your city go to church. How do we break down the barriers so that we can have trusting relationships and teach people the Bible and they can become these kingdom workers. So I had an experience where I, I love teaching the Bible to people who don't go to church. And I was with a guy named Eduardo. We did a couple Bible studies. And he's like, Pastor John, I'm going to read Genesis to Revelation. And I said, good luck, Eduardo. You're going to hit a mountain called Leviticus. <laughs> no. But he came back the next week and he got all the way to Genesis 7. And he said, was there really a flood? And I took the C.S. Lewis approach, and I said, well, Lewis says in every culture there's a flood story. So yeah, I think there really was a flood. And he goes, I can't believe the faith of that guy, Nua. And he built that canoe. <laughs> and it was a real moment for me. He's a blank slate. He's one of these 84% that don't know the message. It's changing rapidly. How are we going to be relevant with the message of hope? Thank you, John. Chrissy. I appreciate what everyone is sharing and I just want to kind of add, I think as I um, imagine what it looks like to be CCDA moving forward, um, I think of our eight key components and I imagine what it would be like if we um, not only were diligent about living those out in our community, but were diligent about living those out among us and as an association? And what would it look like to redistribute power here in our association? And what would it look like to, redis um, to listen to one another really well? And to hear more voices, as Esperanza was sharing, um, there's people that I've talked to this week who say, you know, I just, I don't know if I'm allowed to be heard here. And that grieves me. And how do we continue to be a place where we can hear one another and not just um, disagree well, but that that would we would become creative in that so that we come up with solutions that nobody else is thinking of because they're not listening to each other. And what would it mean as we think about empowerment within our association with um, our young leaders? And, and we joked around here, we're not the youngest leaders. There are young leaders. Um, we have our student initiative and you know, how do we really um, not only listen to what they have to say, but allow them to lead and allow them to make decisions and, and give opportunity for young people to make decisions. And I think um, when we talk about authenticity and, and friendship, I really appreciated the video this morning and was reminded again of, of the friendships and the way that I've been allowed to, to be myself here. Um, but, but I fear when you talk about what are the threats and the, and the fears that, that we wouldn't be afraid to say the things that, that we're thinking and that we wouldn't be afraid to to be authentic. Um, and so those are, are the things that come up for me when you say that. Thank you. As Chrissy has um, shared with us, we realized that we didn't quite know the definition of young, um, that many of us realize that we aren't in that 50% of our um, attendance here is under 30. That gives a little bit away about our age up here. But, um, but we also took seriously, Coach, Noel, Dr. Perkins, that you asked this group of people to be up here to share their voice as young leaders. And as we close, because we just didn't have enough time, we wish we could have had three hours to share together. Um, I'm going to invite each of the panelists to share with you not just what they would like to see happen for CCDA, but as young leaders, where are they, where are we taking CCDA? Where are we leading CCDA? Um, and so I'm gonna start at this end, John. Um, and just a, a minute or two about where, as we reimagine the future together, um, let's reimagine what's next and how are we, as the young leaders, leading CCDA to that place. Thank you. Um, I would just give a, a word of hope 
and also to know why we're called and who calls us. So I love as uh, Dr. Perkins and Coach and Coach are teaching yesterday on the Good Samaritan, I love the connection in Luke 10 as Jesus says he will repay when he returns. It's a connection with Luke 14 that the people who believe in the resurrection will be repaid at the return of the king. So my word of hope would be to stay in the game, to be a person who is selfless and sacrificing, not because we're looking for any results from people, but because we will be repaid at the resurrection of the just for loving people who can't pay us back. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would really have, have two words, two simple words, uh, but two of the most difficult words that in our faith that we could possibly undertake. Number one is love and number two is forgiveness. When we relentlessly love people most unlike ourselves, when we relentlessly love people that the Lord Jesus loves more than anybody, we don't make money doing that. I know we don't. We get hated on, we, we get spit on, we get looked at as weird, we get placed off in a different category. People try and take us down, listening to Harvey Carey last night. And he said, I went to this meeting and the nine other black pastors in my city said, we're gonna pool our resources and take you out. Now here's the sad part, I've heard the same thing. <laughs> That's the problem with love. It's that it's difficult. And when that stuff happens, it's our job to learn how to forgive. We intellectually understand that as Christians, we need to forgive. But the moment that I'm at right now, going through a whole lot of stuff in me and my organization and, and all this stuff coming from, it's like people popping out of the woodworks wanting to accuse us and critique us. And I know I need to forgive them, but I need to get to a point where inside of me, I say, you know what, I actually want to forgive them. And that's what we need to do. We need to relentlessly love and we need to learn what it means to want to forgive people. Now I can stand up, sit up here and say that and sure that sounds nice and I'm not at that place right now because I don't want to forgive them. But I am still working on it. I always say I'm just a dude who's trying to learn how to live in love in real time and that doesn't always work out and it doesn't, it, it's messy and it's uncomfortable and, and you find yourself in a lot of tension filled places but it's worth every second of it for the kingdom that I so boldly claim to be a part of. Amen. As we look at the word we imagine, um, the very definitions, two uh, synonymous words are conceptualize and create. And we know that we have a strong foundation um, with CCDA and CCDA on the eight key components. But I dare to say that Let's do as Chrissy invited us to do, you know, uh, or all of our panels in one way or another. Uh, look at the fact that we're not always on the same page and that everyone has a voice and we're going to love one another and work with one another continuously. Find out that way and, and push in that direction to be uh, creative, uh, finding creative ways to express our, our, our differences and being on uh, different pages and see how we can um, formulate that and package that in a way where it uh, can, you know, uh, adds to the growth of this association uh, that we see every year and that we work towards and um, use as a tool in our different communities. Um, I think that uh, we should, hmm, I'm just having a thought here, uh, but yeah, that's basically what I want to say. Uh, we have the foundation here uh, you have heard from the young leaders the next generation leaders as to um, the things that we're concerned about as uh, association that we will be facing that could potentially be a barrier as we move forward and we heard some solutions again being creative and uh, finding venues and ways and packages that we can express our differences um, I will be praying for the city of Chicago past your youth are not the only youth that are dying you know, I've buried, helped to bury um, cousins and I coach basketball and we lost two Dariuses in six weeks, the same way, violently. And so these are real stories, real things that land our level to what we're doing in our community, which is introducing uh, for a lot of us, uh, Christ 
in the lives of our neighbors, our friends, and our families. And so let's continue to use this. We have not arrived, people. Uh, CCDA is a vehicle that is a movement, which is a system of continued uh, perpetual motion. And with that, it's going to look different as we move forward. So let's reimagine the future of CCDA. Thank you, Andrew. There is a false notion in our country that you can build a relationship with an organization. And unfortunately, the Christian community, the, the Christian world, the church has bought into that. And so we send our organizations to deal with the poor. We send our organizations to fundraise. We send our organizations to serve the poor. Jesus didn't start an organization. An organization has to worry about insurance. An organization has to pay taxes. An organization has to promote itself so it can do the work it's trying to do. And an organization cannot send you somewhere to die. And Christ called us to lose our lives. My people, our people, on our reservations could care less about the organizations of this country. When I shared that analogy of the, of the, the woman up in the bedroom, She's not looking for World Vision, our CCDA, our Inner Varsity, or any of these people, to, these organizations to come up. She's concerned, is John Smith going to come up to my door and sit down by my bed and talk to me? She's concerned about, is Judy Bertinelli or whoever, all these people are going to come in. And so my job as a prophetic voice within CCDA is I don't, I'm not interested in getting your organization out to our reservations. I'm interested in getting you by yourself, one-on-one. -on -one. I want you to make the commitment to walk up that stairs, to pull up that chair, and to sit down next to our people and to say thank you. I want you to go up that stairs on a continual basis and have those conversations. And one of those trips up the stairs, I want you to sit there and say, Grandmother, what do you think about these 350 million immigrants living in your land? We need some wisdom. We've created a problem here and we don't know how to handle it. And we need someone who has a different perspective than our limited perception. Please come and join our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that what I can, how I reimagine CCDA for the, for, for the future is more of uh, making a commitment to CCDA uh, today. Uh, I think that because sometimes I didn't feel like I fit in or I didn't uh, uh, live out the three R's exactly as they're described, that I had a foot out and a foot in. And I think that m the future of CCDA is about committing to it and committing to be vulnerable in it and to be challenged by it and to not feel comfortable. Uh, and my, my commitment continues to be to go back home um, and translate what this means and make it real and tangible for a community that doesn't look like your typical community out in West Kendall where you know, everyone drives in and, and we don't have walkable places and we don't have one central uh, you know, place and, um, Gabriel and I were talking about how our Hispanic immigrant church is trying to just model the big uh, white churches because we think that's the right thing to do and, and to challenge that. So I think that my position and my, what I can bring in terms of leadership is to continue to challenge myself, first of all, and to commit to continue and to stay regardless of how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, for myself, um, and I'm something that I'm working on in myself and, and just trying to, but I was a youth pastor for six years before I was a pastor. And so I'm going to always lean towards empowering the voice that's rarely heard. And that's the voice that feels the effects, the greatest of our mistakes, of our vulnerability, of our not knowing what to do, of us not thanking our grandmother for the ones who feel that are our children the ones who are the most vulnerable, the ones who have the least voice. And so as I reimagine and as I lead, 
Uh, I pray that those kids that are in the student leadership intensive in another hotel away from us that come to visit every once in a while, that they would have this table, that they would have this mic, and that 3,000 people, 300, whatever many people here would listen to them because we believe that the people who have the answers are the people who have the problems. Yeah. Wow, I resonate with the things that you're all sharing. Thank you. Um, I just want to pick up on something that you said uh, to, about being relevant, and I don't disagree, but I think that um, we need to become relevant by not, not by being like others, but becoming more like ourselves. And being the peculiar people who are the ones... I, I feel like there are power players in this room. And what if we were the ones who came up with the solution for immigration? What if we were the ones who went and said, you know what, we came up with this idea and it's not like anything else that we've heard and we think it's going to work. And we have the power of people in our communities who are affected by it behind us to make it happen. And so when I say let's hear one another, and, and I keep thinking of what um, Dr. Um, Barbara Skinner said to us the first night, like, let's hang on to one another in the things that we're in. As we do that, I think not only to hear one another or to dialogue, but really to be the ones who have the solutions to the things that we're seeing and our problems, because um, we are led by the scriptures and we're led by Jesus into those places and into those answers. And the other thing I just want to say quickly is that um, that we would not take ourselves so seriously, that we would have joy in the work and joy in the journey. And um, I think often for me, I'll speak for myself, I can get so serious and, and the problems seem so urgent and so important and they are, but um, my neighbors, they, they teach me to have great joy and they teach me to make fun of myself and um, to see how ridiculous I am quite often. And if, if we can't laugh and, and be together and find joy in what we're doing, um, then as we heard last night, then we're missing something of following Jesus. Thank you. Gabriel. Yeah, I think that in terms of the future of CCD, that video that preceded us filled me with so much hope and it provoked me to so much jealousy. <laughs> you know, I was just, I'm, part of the future, I think, is to cultivate spaces like that so those friendships can endure. This world is run on relationships. Our gospel is a relationship gospel. The Trinity is relational, you know, and, and, and you know, I'm, I hunger for that. And that if CCDA, could, you can't create relationships, but you can be a gathering place. You can cultivate, you can, you can nurture, you can, you can model, you know. And I'm wondering if as CCDA grows and matures, uh, like wine with age, it gets better. Uh, if the association doesn't become so institutionalized that there's no room for the relationship. And then we lose our souls. You know, and so my, my concern is and my hope is that we practice our first works, as the, as the New Testament says, practice our first works over again. So that that's not a rarity, but that's all over this country and all over this globe, that those circles of transparency and authenticity are being repeated and that CCDA is helping cultivate that. I want to, you know, I wrote something on immigration reform for the Trenton Times and Two days later, I got a mail in my office, no return address, and it had pictures of me being beheaded. And immediately, I, I panicked. I panicked because my son is in the daycare where I work, and he's five. Now he's five. He was four then. And I called security, and, and I panicked. And. I called my friend Louis Carlo and others and they prayed for me. They didn't say it was going to be okay. You know, they prayed for me. And I said, oh, wow, you know what? That's what she said. It's that community that's beyond an institution. That when all of us stand up for a Christ reason, not, not for God. I'm sick of, of kind of this popularizing and having rock stars. I don't want rock stars. 
We're not rock stars. We're you and you're us. You know, none of us has arrived. We're struggling. We're still full of fear. I'm still full of fear. But that I have this familia. That when I stand up and I, and I, so I ran to the daycare. The, the police came. They pulled my son out. I had to call my wife. And Louis Carlo prayed for me and others uh, from around the country sent me emails. And I said, oh, this is CCDA. This, this is what, it, what it's about. And that one of them said to me, see, Gabriel, esto lo que es ser líder. This is what it is to be a leader. And somehow in my journey that's different from everybody else's, in my suffering, they stopped Peter Panizing me. I'm no longer a young leader because my, they have pictures of me being beheaded. Now I'm a leader. It's a fascinating. You know, we have to worry. Uh, please don't make that the mark of leadership. Uh, that we don't Peter Panize as we institutionalize. You know, the median age here is about 37.5 which is the new 27.5. <laughs> so, so the challenge, I think, is to have traditioned innovation. That's not my phrase. That's out of Duke Leadership School. Traditioned innovation, flexibility. And I think that, that the best way to do it is, is through, through the prophetess that I love and, and have a shrine at my house for. Prophetess Whitney Houston. <laughs> I believe the children are the future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Amen. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense. Amen. So when I told my son what was happening in his four-year-old language, he said, Daddy, did we do something good? <laughs> Amen. each of you um, we are not up on a pedestal we're just up on this podium and only for a few minutes we are you you are we um, and I know that each of the people that have been sharing with you for the last 35 40 minutes would love a chance if you want to to sit down and to talk with you we start with relationships we will end with relationships and all the way through it's about relationships and so we invite you to join with us in reimagining and as I close, I will read a few words from the most wise reimaginer. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. For I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. And as we walk that journey, hear these words from that Lord. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire or letters that come with pictures of you, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Do not fear, for I am with you. Thank you.